Hey, this is Karen, Coach's Corner Chats, and on the podcast, I have Scott Forster. Scott, where are you at, and what are you up to? Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, I am the head coach at Bluefield State College, uh, and that's in Bluefield, West Virginia, right at the bottom of, of West Virginia. And uh, what side, like male, female, and what division is that school? Great, great question. Yeah, we're a Division II school. Uh, NCAA Division Two, and we uh, only have women's soccer right now. One of the things that I just, I hear the, t- the tone of your voice, that doesn't sound like a West Virginia tone. So where were you born and raised? Honestly, it's one of the funniest things that I do around here is that I, I live in Princeton, which is about six miles from Bluefield. And everybody in Bluefield says to me, that accent it's not from around here is it where, where are you from and i say oh i'm from princeton six miles and it, it, it totally throws them off but it's it's definitely a good year yeah no i'm originally from newcastle in england uh it's kind of uh, a long journey to get to west virginia but kind of a cool one and uh i have to say it's kind of interesting how many coaches at the ncaa level are from west virginia uh, in west virginia are from newcastle it's uh, seven or eight out of the 16 programs which is kind of unbelievable when you start to work through and, and think about that it's kind of cool the the interesting thing for me is i think you might be the fourth coach that i've had on the podcast who's from newcastle so i have to hook you up with some of those names uh yeah. when we get off what was it like growing up in that type of environment newcastle um everybody i've talked to that's from there is like it's all newcastle don't bring up yeah. other names that's all it's about yeah, it's a work hard, play hard part of the world. You know, my granddad worked as a welder and a shipbuilder. Um, my grand, my dad was a carpenter and, uh, you know, later started a business and started his own thing. But ultimately it's, I guess the best way to describe it to the American eye, if you've been around the East Coast is, I'd say Pittsburgh's probably the closest. Maybe a Pittsburgh or a Boston where, you know, you're out and you're doing your blue collar job and then at the weekend you go party, you put your time in, you know, you do the things like that. And um, it's definitely a, a town that reminds me of that. Like when you go to Pittsburgh, it's one color. Everything's black and gold. It's the same in Newcastle. When you go there, you don't see other jerseys. You see Newcastle jerseys and that's it. Uh, and, and that for me, you know, growing up was, um, you know, being involved in youth soccer there, being involved in just being part of that you know, commitment to soccer. You grew up every day, either watching a game or, or playing, you know, and, and the only thing that stopped me going professional, and this is my dad's joke, is that we had a dog that chewed all the soccer balls. So it was kind of, for, for, it's, the, it's the joke in the family, but it's, it, it, you know, in, in reality, it comes down to the fact that uh, at the time when I was growing up, the Newcastle was in a resurgency. It was coming out of a really kind of a darker period of its history in Division Two, stepping up back to, you know, as the Premier League was starting, um, and we had a, a coach there called Kevin Keegan who kind of took over the reins there, who kind of had that attitude of, you know, you can score three, you can score four, but I'm going to score five or I'm going to score six, and it created some of the craziest uh, results in the Premier League. You know, there's a very famous 4-3 loss in at Liverpool, and you know, some of the larger 5-0 victories. You know, beating Manchester United. You know, that kind of era. Of, of soccer was really called uh, the entertainers and I think anybody who grew up in that spell really couldn't help but fall in love with you know soccer as a possession based game as you know something that you can fall in love with something that makes you passionate about wanting to kind of get involved in the sport. Was Coach Keegan maybe the impetus for you wanting to get into coaching or how did you come about to want to become a coach? That's a good question. I think coaching for me was always there. Even as a player, I found myself coaching in teams that never had a formal coach and just trying to help other people. And I think that I've always had a facet of my personality that wants to give and wants to help. And I think that that, that's never more validated than in a coaching arena. Um, Keegan was a little bit more of a kind of talisman and I've done this, you can follow me type of coach. Um, and I've never really been one for that myself. Um, I don't really like to stand at the front of the battle and cheer and follow me with a big sword. You know, I don't think that works. Um, but I'm kind of more of a consensus builder and uh, a pathfinder and an encourager. And I think that that's really more um, aligned with a famous Newcastle coach called Sir Bobby Robson. He also coached Barcelona and, and England and, and, and a few other clubs as well. 
So what does your first coaching experience look like? Is it in Newcastle and, and how does it come about and what does it look like for you? Um, I started playing and played in, in university. I played at, at, at my second university I went to as well. They were both in the UK where there's not the NCAA rules. So I could continue to play, you know, more than that four years. Um, I was playing as a postgraduate student and uh, the team that I was playing on was really my friends and some local guys who worked at a utility company who were a little bit older um, and it was kind of really an inheritance of the challenge of that moment of having 19 guys who needed someone to organize them and I just kind of stepped forward and took on that responsibility um, not necessarily as a captain or as a leader on the field which I think I did do but more to you know make sure we had the right number of people there at the start you know making sure that we could keep 19 players happy uh, so that you had 11 to, to play and at the time you know the level that we were playing that you're only allowed three substitutes at the time so it was a challenge to keep 19 20 people involved in the team uh, and, and yet only being able to play that 14 and sometimes 13 in the game when you're holding a sub in case somebody gets injured so you know my first challenge in coaching was probably the hardest managing men who didn't want to be there you know, uh, people who had other things to do in their lives, you know, at a level that wasn't really, you know, um, an elite level, but it certainly challenged me in terms of that connection and that community of, of, of bringing together, you know, people who wanted to do something together on the field. And I think that validated a lot of the, the beliefs that I bring to the coaching scene and at the youth level now, um, and also, you know, even up into, into the Division Two level you know, this last year, but it's understanding what makes people tick and why they want to be part of a team and trying to find the motivation inside of them that can be linked together to give something bigger than just what the individual can provide. As leadership and leading others, you've talked about how Keegan did his thing and how Coach Robson did his thing. Um, is that a, a quality that you've had even as a youth, as you were growing up, have you always been one to kind of step up and like, okay, let's get organized. Let's take care of things. I think there's a little bit of a stubbornness inside of me that just, I think I'm very good at, at looking at uh, where we are and seeing where we want to be. Uh, and that was really also backed up in my career outside of soccer. Um, I, I was had a career developing medical equipment alongside coaching for almost 15 years. Um, and then when I moved to Silicon Valley, um, the coaching became, became more and more important in my daily life and I could earn money enough in that to then step away from designing medical equipment. You know, I'm lucky enough to have gone through and, uh, and I think that the, the thing that you have there is a skill set of leading a team that is directly translatable. Um, and, and also a skill set from coaching that I've never really realized was directly translatable and talked about in other spheres that I'd, that I'd missed. And maybe if I'd read more, um, I would have caught it. But there's certainly an interesting piece of feedback that I had from one of my old head coaches was that Manchester United actually used um, a Toyota development process for making a product for developing their players. And they use this cycle of continuous improvement that gets talked about in the Toyota manufacturing systems about making a, 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 a piece to fit into a product or making the product itself. And how do you make that and improve that with time? You have to you know, build it, test it, uh, reflect on what that situation is, put it in a real world environment, review it, and then start again on redesigning. And that cycle of continuous improvement is something that I used on my my day job, so to speak, for several, you know, probably seven to 10 years and never really connected that it was helping me in the coaching arena, probably until four or five years ago when I read that article, um, connecting it to what Manchester United were doing. And I'm not a Manchester United fan in any way, shape or form, but it's kind of interesting <laughs> how they pull resources from all these different areas to try and improve what they can do uh, in, in developing the youth player. So I was just going to ask, and I think you kind of shared it, how did you end up getting to the U.S.? So was it your actual main job or was it coaching that brought you to the States? Um, weirdly enough, it was marrying an American. That was ultimately the, 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 the resolution. Hmm. I was working in um, medical device design. I was coaching. I actually took a break for, for nearly three years in full time, like supporting one or two teams like a youth coach. 
because I'd moved to Germany and I was traveling backwards and forwards too much to be able to commit to, uh, to a team in full. Um, that was kind of just after the World Cup in, in Germany. And I got connected into the youth system in Germany, but my German just simply wasn't good enough to teach seven and eight and, and nine year olds. But I enjoyed doing that. And then when I came to the US, um, I was moving here for one job and had a work permit set up for that. There was a bit of a, an economic crash in sort of that 2008, 2009 time period that stopped me being able to reside here. And ultimately I made the, the the decision to to get married and I could stay inside of the US because of that. Um, ultimately, I was still, you know, I was in California at the time, you know, to pay the bills. There was no way you were doing youth coaching. Um, you know, it simply wasn't, or I or hats off to anybody who can afford to do that in California because it certainly was a challenge for me. But I, I basically took a job as a volunteer coach at San Jose State, helping with their club team, the men's club team. Um, and that was in addition to my working day. So I'd go and coach them three times a week on an evening, just bringing things from the adult game that I had, just, you know, no structure from coaching badges that I'd done in the past, but more just, hey, we don't do this very well. Can we try this? And, you know, in my past, I've always been a coach that if I see something, I get a bit creative. I don't really fall into the, like, the textbook look for something. I kind of think, well, when I was a kid, I did that. How do I reinforce that? How do I bring that to the forefront? And with those, you know, um, the club uh, boys at, at San Jose State, they're sort of the, they're the 18, 19, 20 year olds. You had to be engaging. You had to be kind of committed to, you know, proving that you could help them. You know, and we went on to um, get to the West Coast Open Cup. Uh, and we won that in San Diego, traveling down there, which just was just a buzz, you know? It was one of those things where it really was just them having structure for the first time, I think, that really helped having a leader to say, well, hey, you're gonna get rolling subs, you're gonna have that time, rather than it being, you know, seniors in the team, picking the team and managing that in the process of them playing. Um, so I won't take a lot of credit for that, other than the fact that it was my first ever kind of ice bucket over my head, which was, you know, a shock to me, but a cool experience nonetheless. Um, and yeah, having come out of that, two or three of those players, I really thought had an opportunity to go and play at a higher level. Um, and I reached out to um, the new head coach. He was literally in the job three or four weeks um, at San Jose State, which was the D1 um, head coach in Simon Tobin. And, you know, fair play to Simon. He just kind of laughed at me and said, like, there's no way a club kid is going to come and play D1 with me. Um, and, and even a bigger credit to Simon was him coming back afterwards and apologizing because one of the boys who I kind of recommended to him went on to get a scholarship at the D2 level uh, and, and set a scoring record on the West Coast um, for goals scored per game. And, you know, I don't think there's very many coaches that would do this called me back up and said hey was that that kid you were talking to me about I said, yeah and he goes I screwed up <laughs> I'm sorry <laughs> you know, who does that right it, it, it's such a credit to Simon that he was kind of you know humble but also supportive and that he was like well what can I do to help you in this you know in the area what can I do to help you you know with your next steps and he's certainly been a, a, a long-term mentor of mine and the reference that I've you know, relied on in terms of, you know, hey, this is a, a credit to, you know, someone in the Bay Area who's applied themselves in that field. And um, yeah, so it was interesting. He, he kind of called me up and said, like, you, you, you want to go for a, for a meal? You want to go for, for wine or beer? What's your choice? Coffee? It's on me. So he kind of, you know, he, he kind of repaid that little sort of hilarity of, of not catching the right fish, if you know what I mean. Um, and I, I absolutely respect him more than anyone that I've met on the West Coast coaching. He's, you know, an absolutely cool coach um, for that, you know, doing awesome things for that program. Um, I had the great joy of through him, you know, recommending me into another coaching arena to get really formally started on coaching, you know, youth soccer. Excuse me. I was going to ask, what was the, what were some of the things that you recognized that were different from 
the players you're dealing with overseas and the ones that you ran into in California? Because there's always this like, you know, England plays a certain way and it's kind of rough and tough and all that. And America's always still working on maybe a style and an identity. What, what kind of things did you see differently? And you talk about the coaching thing of giving them just some structure of like, and, and what have you. I think the biggest thing that I feel like as an English coach coming to the US was just the utilization of some of the tools that are very, very common in England for winning or competing in a game that I don't think pop out to the average American coach. So, you know, it's really weird in the US that offside seen as this sort of like dirty mistake by a forward, right? Like, you know, they ran too early or they, you know, the ball was kicked too quickly or it's, it, there's like this like, oh, you know, I think it's from youth soccer where, you know, too many parents are shouting about it. Um, but for me, offside and managing a player through not necessarily an offside trap, but a higher line and having your defenders understand when that's a good thing to get up the field and when it's a bad thing to get up the field. I think that was really tactically missing at every level that I've been around. Um, so understanding that there's a time and a place to set a low block that allows you to absorb pressure versus knowing that if you play the ball long and their tactic is going to be to quickly return the ball, the best thing you can do is get out. Excuse me. <coughs> and allow your team to go and press, but also allow your team to get the ball back quick because they don't understand that that fast ball forward is a, is a flag. And that, that for me has won you know, not as a head coach, but as an assistant, being able to communicate that on, on the women's game in Montana, you know, probably won us two or three games, you know, 26 plus offsides in one half, just from a lack of understanding of what that means and how you then change the way you play versus, you know, a long ball forward. Is in, in America, I feel like there's still too much of that quarterback mentality of, I've got the ball, how do I get it forward to get a scoring opportunity rather than keeping the ball, making it work and, and migrating it around to find that opportunity and that opening. And I think that's changing, um, thankfully. The other thing you mentioned earlier was grandpa working on ships, dad, you know, working hard, doing his own business. What was the family take on you saying, you know what, I'm pursuing this coaching gig as my uh, full-time job? It really took me working at a company for 15 years and having it as my passion to then be able to stand up and say, I should have done this 20 years ago, you know? And I regret not doing that, but thankfully that experience in developing products and working in the medical industry and working in medical sales as well has given me so many transferable skills now that I call upon every day as a coach. I wouldn't change it but I didn't have the bravery uh, as a young person to say, "Hey, this is my dream, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna stick my you know my money to that mast." You know, I really went and 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 heard the family say, "Hey, there's a lot of money to be made elsewhere. There's a lot of energy to be applied into the business world. Why not go and do that?" And you know, I think. You know, I think my dad and I definitely acknowledge that it, 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 you know, it was the right thing to do. You know, it's allowed me to move to West Virginia and buy a house. It's allowed me to, you know, to have the lifestyle that I can have now and focus on coaching um, full time. But it was definitely a challenge as a young person. And I think that as a coach, that's always an interesting place to find yourself with that experience, to find your place where you, all of the crossroads of what can make you successful kind of meet. Um, there's a Japanese um, word that I'm going to butcher, but essentially I think it's called Ikagi, which is the meeting place of your um, the vision that the world has for you, the mission that you find within yourself, the, the, the area where the world can pay you, uh, and you know that and, and, and those areas that overlap, it's like a Venn diagram of kind of that place where you need to be. Uh, and I think that I was always there, but I don't think the world was ready to pay me as a 20 year old boy stepping out of college to, to be a soccer coach, you know? It just simply, in, in England, it's it's a challenge unless you're an ex-pro stepping out of the game, there's opportunities there, but the, the US really is the land of opportunity in that regard that 
you know, I could come here and show my passion for the game, you know, apply it to the youth soccer world, apply it to, you know, lower level adult coaching and, and see where that went. So you connect with the coach at San Jose State, um, get great feedback from him after he realizes that you might know what you're talking about when it comes to player identification. Where's the next step after that in your coaching journey? Yeah, he, he kind of directed me to a local academy that was um, literally, as I was talking to them, was adopting or bringing themselves to join the Liverpool International Academy family. And that's in San Jose. And, it, you know, I know there's several others that were around the whole of the US, including Massachusetts and all and Michigan and all these other places. Um, the Bay Area um, area of that opened up. Um, I was there helping their U23 men's program on the recommendation of, you know, of Simon to kind of connect into that. And I literally got a call from the president saying, hey, there's 12 young uh, U12 players on the female side rocking up to where you're coaching. The coach who's supposed to coach them can't make it. Can you step in and cover it? So I'd gone from like U23 adult men's to then having to do, you know, literally within 15 minutes, <laughs> setting up and jumping into U12 girls. And I guess I'm a kind of personality where I'm either in or I'm out. And once I was in, I was like, well, you know, these girls deserve my time as much as anybody. And I just ran like a session that I would, you know, to get to know them, lots of touches, lots of ball work, lots of technical stuff that kind of kept it going. Um, and, you know, at the start of the session, there was all these parents complaining that this other coach wasn't there. And by the end of the session, the girls were kind of like, you know, laughing, joking and enjoying soccer. And then I think that kind of eased the situation an awful lot. And then I had that team, you know, for not for nearly four years. Uh, and, you know, at the time, Liverpool Bay Area had no uh, women's teams at all. And that was the first start of that. I grew with that group to, you know, within four weeks, we had 49 people coming to that session. Yeah, it was crazy. I'm not going to lie. I was bringing in San Jose boys to help and offering them Quakes tickets to kind of come and volunteer, you know, getting them background checked and then getting them involved and being able to move Cohen's and, you know, get that through. I ended up doing, you know, four sessions a night for four days. And it got to a point where we had 76 kids in the program. We got up to 250 at the end. When I was starting to step out, we had 17 teams. You know, it, it just ballooned. And um, I think my personality helped a little bit, but it was engaging and kind of, you know, just passionate, I guess. Um, and I think there was a lot of youth women soccer players who just had a bad experience. You know, they'd gone to a coach and a coach had been, you know, either in their face about something or didn't understand how to communicate differently with, you know, a 12 year old girl versus wherever they'd been coaching before. And uh, I was lucky that I had a friend of mine who was, um, he's in his 60s now. He had two daughters who went through the American youth system, both played, well, one played D1, one played D2 um, as, as young adults, and they both completed school. And he literally sent me a page from the back of a diary with like 10 rules of working with youth women. And it was like, you know, it basically said like, destroy this after you're reading it. It was a little bit mission impossible, but that was another thing that I'll take. That moment for me of reading somebody else's, you know, 20 year reflection of, you know, don't call out Jenny. You can't stand there and shout at Jenny because the rest of the team looks at you and goes, this coach is a pain in my butt. He's, he's picking on my friend, you know? You can talk to that person on an individual basis, but you can't do it in front of the group. Where with youth boys, if you shout out at John and say, hey, John, you're not doing the right things, the rest of the team goes, oh, OK, we can take John's space. We can go and, you know, it's kind of a different feel of the two groups and how they react in the moment. There's obviously something evolutionary that we needed to have happen in these kind of assignments and the way that that works. But it's very interesting to me that I just read through these kind of 10 things and that kept me going. And I can't remember them now. I should have written them down myself, but it's one of those ones where it just kind of honed me in on the differences between, you know, adult men's and, and U12 um, girls. And it kind of kept me real. I love how you kind of ended that little scenario because I was thinking, how do you go from 
like when you were at Man or, or at Newcastle overseas with guys that were your age and you're just dealing with men and they're working full time and they're just coming to play to now dealing with the U23 group to now all of a sudden it's not just younger but it's a completely different gender and you make some great points dealing with boys is completely different than dealing with boys or girls I'm sorry um, and I thought that was some great points so that thing grows and balloons and it's it sounds like it gets like really really intense yeah what goes on next well I, I met a, a, another coach who was establishing another club nearby and I got to a point where I was wanting to be in a position where I could go full-time soccer so I'm you know at one point I was coaching seven youth teams and holding down a day job now I and I kid you not <laughs> when did you sleep I well don't tell my old boss but I slept a lot in the office <laughs> literally putting a bag under the desk and locking my door and and, and it, looking looking back it wasn't the right thing to do but it happened um and you know I'd finish work I'd fight Bay Area traffic to get to the first training session sort of at 4 30. I'd leave early on a morning at sort of 6 30 to get into the office at 7 so I could do a day's work and then still get out there and then thank goodness for floodlights you know you're doing the older age groups at 9 9 15 closing out at 10 30 going home going to bed you know and eating in the car in traffic you know, managing that whole thing and you know that seven teams is an impossible thing because it wasn't doing them justice and i ended up at a, I had a wonderful scheduler who could basically align all of the games on a weekend for me to be able to get between a lot of them but i also kind of had an assistant who would step in and you know could get to the game start a warm-up for me so i could arrive and then you know engage and, and i really you know it got to a point where i was frustrated because i couldn't give it my all because it got too big and one of the things that came out of that kind of moment was also just the pay to play processes that were happening in youth soccer and still are happening in youth soccer kind of came to the forefront that I was struggling with. Hey, there's a young girl who's from Hispanic family, you know, dad's struggling to make ends meet, mom's looking after, you know, four or five brothers or sisters and she can't pay the $6,000 that it is to go and play club soccer and, you know, or, or the 3,000, whatever it was at the time. and for me it was became almost this sort of business frustration with the powers that be above me um and right at that sort of crossroads um i met sean sakiris who is or was at the time the u uh 16 17 men's national team coach uh, and he was reloc relocating back to the bay area connecting into his local town club and he was looking for somebody to, you know, I'd been director of coaching uh, at Liverpool, you know, I was coaching two or three teams at the time. I took the step over to, to help him set up the trials process to organize that kind of the core of what makes a youth soccer club tick and grow, you know, and we added 180 players in one tryout window through that process. We recruited some coaches, we kind of set up some good principles and I, I learned more in sort of the 17, 18 weeks with him than, than I've ever learned. It was just phenomenal. You know, little things like starting a dribbling drill where he adds a specific foot position touch requirement. So it's not just dribble between the cones, it's laces, toe, pinky before you hit the first cone. You know, and setting something in a youth player's mind that isn't just hey, there's some cones I'm dribbling through, but like, what can I do to change the way I'm addressing the ball and my body shape to the ball, you know, in that minor moment? That's just one thing that I saw and observed and been able to follow him around. I was coaching one of the um, 2007 boys teams. His son was a 2007 boy, so he was kind of always involved in, you know, our like aligned training session time. And just being able to see him at work was, you know, it was phenomenal, you know, and, I know he's, you know, going through the process of, you know, next steps in his career right now. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited to see when he can announce that. It's pretty exciting. It sounds like you're having tons of success at the youth level. I mean, the numbers you're growing, you're building like just quality teams and what have you and having success. At what point does 
do you start thinking maybe I start going beyond the youth level? I mean, how does how do you end up getting to the college level? I know you mentioned Montana earlier, and I'm yeah. sure we'll get to that. Is so that I the next step? That segue because that's the, it's honestly it's the perfect timing. <laughs> so. Um, what I was doing was I wanted to get some formal badges and some education to back up my kind of like where I was. And I, at the time, didn't understand the differences between the, the, the then coaching pathway with what was NSCA or mm -hmm. what is now United Soccer Coaches and the USSF pathway <laughs> to me as an english guy i didn't even acknowledge i didn't even know about that i just saw coaching courses and got involved and i went to one coaching course in the bay area and the guy running it was just it just put me off it shut me down it was the f license or an e license i don't remember and it was just so poorly mismanaged i just couldn't i couldn't even tolerate the finishing the course i was like this is just stupid um, you know, literally things that made me like, this isn't soccer, this isn't what I want to be doing. Like it didn't, it didn't help me. I, I got a mark pulled against my name because I had my socks pulled down. Like it was that kind of like stupidity at the time. And I'm glad that there's been so many changes since then, but it was definitely a frustration that then drove me to be like, well, why am I wasting my time doing that when I know I'm doing other good things in, on my own? I want to get feedback. I want to get com commentary. I want to get like criticism that's useful to me. And I kind of found that inside of um, the alternative path. I didn't really know that how that would work out, but I went and did a level six course and I had a, a coach that was, you know, engaging and supportive. And basically we got rained out um, off the field because it was, you know, it was California, but it was raining, which is unusual. <laughs> and I was at Cal State um, Chico and it was kind of a longer course, a weekend one that I was doing and we were in the gym and I saw the NCAA logo and I was kind of just like, I, I really did want, it was one of those moments in my life where I was just like, why can't I do that? You know, and I stood there and I still have the selfie. I took a, a selfie on my phone at the end of the course with the logo behind me and like kind of made myself a plan of I was going to go home and look into how I could become a coach at the college level. And it, it was literally like a lightning bolt. Um, I went home, I looked up at the jobs online. I found out that you needed to have your um, you know, the first responder. I saw other things with strength and conditioning in. I couldn't work out how to get into that. I looked at other things about, you know, X level, you know, years coaching experience, so on and so forth. And I really worked out that the pathway to get there was to go and volunteer somewhere and make yourself indispensable. That was my kind of plan. Um, and at first I was kind of very, very naive. I sent off my CV to D1, power five jobs, you know, literally like, well, I could do that. You know, had no idea, um, had no idea that of the, of the, the, you know, the thought process other than to just get my name out there and maybe somebody will listen. And of course, nobody even replied. I think I got a, the one, I got one reply from, I think Georgia Southwestern about two years after I'd applied. <laughs> I got like a, hey, we're removing your CV from our database kind of thing. <laughs> And then, funnily enough, about five years later, they, they, they sent me an email saying, we'd like you to apply for a linguistics professor's job. I'm like, what? Where did, where did this come from? So, you know, and I'm now on the alumni lists as well. So I don't know what happens at Georgia Southwest, but it's definitely been an interesting <laughs> process to, to work my way through the levels there. But ultimately, I, um, I went to uh, a premier, I, I've done my advanced national, and then I went and did my premier um, course, which was a week residency. And I would encourage people to do those residency courses because you literally live and breathe and share space with so many talented coaches. And I was in a dorm room of eight people and it was me as a club coach. Uh, it was at the time it was one head coach at the D2 level and a whole array of D2 assistants. Every one of those D2 assistants is now a head coach. Yeah. And the head coach is now an assistant. 
which is even funnier because he's he moved from um, his uh, D2 head coaching job. He's now an assistant at D1 level. And it was really that connectivity to basically open up a forum to talk about soccer, to do the daily stresses of that course. So it was, you know, a, a burdensome activity, you, you know, from eight o'clock in the morning till eight o'clock at the night, you were running full-time soccer, which was awesome for me. It was like the drug that I needed, you know? And it was, it was really building on the energy that I thought I already have to say, hey, I can go do this. I can go and take what I know and apply it and learn from somebody else and steal, you know, this from his session. And, oh, that's a great part of what I could do. And on the premier course, you really sit down and go through each day is a different formation. So you have a guest speaker who comes and talks about his team or her team and says, this is how I set my team up. This is my this is my version of 4-3-3. The next day, this is my version of 3-5-2. The next day, this is my version of 4-4-2. And it was so engrossing to be part of that and invigorating that it really kind of, it was the boost that I need or needed to be like, hey, I can go do the next steps. I can go find the next level. And honestly, I made contacts there that I'm, I, I, that room, I'd say I'm regularly in touch with five of the, of the other people in that room on a regular basis. And I've texted two of them this week, you know, asking them their, their opinion on this or forwarding them, uh, 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 you know, uh, something, hey, could you check that? What do you think to this player? Just because it's, it feels like you've made bonds in that time that really kind of could just, you know, do last forever if you get the right click and the right feel for what's going on there. Um, one of those individuals um, would probably be my um, second to last mentor that I could talk about during the call, and that was Alex Balog, who at the time was the head coach at Montana State Billings. And um, to be quite frank with you, uh, I think the initial contact to me was they needed a driver, um, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna <laughs> cut that cut the you know there was no magic moment of like oh come be a coach it was like we're flying to California it's not that far from you could you come and drive the van because we don't have enough people to drive the van and to do that I literally had to go and do my NCAA coaches test my background check to be able to step in as a volunteer. And I basically started a volunteer assistant coach's job through that process. And he was, he and he is a wonderful person who's encouraged me at every step of my career since and supports me, you know, whenever I need it. Um, and he's just a great person, you know, and a smart soccer brain. So to get your foot in the door, you literally ended up being the the team bus driver. Yeah, so we get started. The whole normally for uh, for for MSUB in Montana they'll fly a travel team, so it's you know 18 players. But at the start of the season, um, coach wanted to have uh, the whole team go, so he didn't have enough players to drive the minivans when they landed in LAX. So there was an assistant coach, a coach, uh, an athletic trainer. And the head coach and I was the fifth fifth driver and I showed up he posted me a, 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 a pullover or a sweatshirt um, I turned up uh, met them at the airport shook a couple of hands got them in the van and and I'd done my defensive driving course online I ticked all the boxes you know literally I did everything to try and get involved and then we played a series of games so it was like three games in California um, at MSUB and I had my first, like, that night was my first ever team meal and at the team meal, I was addicted. I literally was sat there going, this is the only thing I'm gonna do now. I'm gonna go home, I'm gonna hand in my notice, I'm gonna be a volunteer, whatever I'm gonna do because I just have to be part of what this is. Um, and so, you know, I we went to play our, you know, we played um, Cal State Pomona, we played um, Cal State San Bernardino, and between one of the other games, um, Alex said to me, hey, look, we're doing like a light session with the team that played the overtime. It was a full, like, uh, you know, 12, 15 players had been heavily involved in the game to try and win the overtime game. And there was 10 guys who basically hadn't seen the field, you know? 
and he just said, hey, could you take the 10 guys and just do a session? Just whatever you want, just keep them moving, whatever you like. And I just went and ran one of my sessions and afterwards the guys were talking and raving about the session and I didn't even know. And they were telling Alex about, you know, oh, this, you know, this was a really good, you know, and that gave me kind of a shoe in the door that here, maybe I wasn't just a club coach, you know, trying, maybe there was a bit more to it than that. And, you know, and, and that kind of, as the role grew and grew and grew, I had that opportunity to do more and more things. Like I flew out for senior day, um, you know, I got, and you know promote not promoted but you know released into the position where i could scout you know from california remote um because one of the other assistants had left and you know it left it left me with a position where i could go i flew to billings i did the you know the online assessment at the time passed that with you know flying colors and then <laughs> able to recruit in california we had you know two you know, one um, guy signed up to go there and he decommitted because he got offered a contract with the Quakes, but it was kind of the right thing, you know, to do to try and find, you know, players at a level that was, would help. Um, and being able to go on senior day and be on the bench and get a feel for that, I was, you know, looking to try and get that next step um, and, and, you know, be able to jump into that and, you um, Alex then got the job at, at Villanova and moved to the East Coast as an assistant. And I kind of knew, I kind of worked out, hey, I don't think I'm going to be able to be remote anymore. I don't think the new guy coming in will want that. I, I was kind of working out whether I could volunteer and, and jump in full time to go to Billings. And just as that was kind of falling out, luckily for me, the um, I was still doing the youth women's and they were now, you know, 2001, 2002, starting to think about college and not, maybe not going to college, but the recruitment process. And just as that was kind of connecting up, um, the women's assistant at Montana left. So I kind of combined the two arrows and they hit each other in, in my movement from the men's game to the women's game. And, you know, that was super fun. Um, I, I didn't, you know, thankfully I, I, I was offered the job. It wasn't, by no means was it, uh, oh, well, you you know, we already know you because you were on the men's side. I'd never met the, the women's head coach because every time I'd gone to Montana, he was away while the men were at home. And I just never, you know, I'd been to his house and, you know, seen the hat, but never met him, um, which was kind of like that going and doing the interview and just, you know, putting yourself out there as like, this is what I like to do. This is how it is. and. You know, for a male coach on the women's side to take me on as, a, as a, an assistant who's never been a full-time assistant somewhere else was a gamble. But, um, you know, Stephen is, is probably my last mentor. Not probably, he is 100% is my last mentor in this process. And he was the head coach and still is the head coach at MSUB in, in, in Billings in Montana right now. And he basically gave me the next layer of advice at the elite level beyond those 10 things you don't do in youth women's soccer. And he gave me a skill set that allowed me to operate inside of an NCAA Division II women's soccer program and not screw up every day. Um, and he bared with me through the bumps and the mistakes and, and, you know, the kind of the challenges that I had getting started with that. Um, but, you know, longer term, we came up with a really cool strategy of me expanding how he liked to recruit. You know, he was always, I always felt like the program was recruiting that next window, you know, looking at, you know, he would still be looking for players now to try and get to 2022. And I just said, hey, we, we got to break that. We got to change that. I know we're not a D1 program, but it doesn't mean we can't act like one. And how do we build up the database is how do we expand the, the, the funnel of people interested in the school, you know, from, from this big to, to this big and what can we do in, 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 even in season to be able to make that work. And I don't think he'd ever had an assistant before who, you know, was taking calls every day during the season, you know, advertising new camps, getting, we went from having 12 to 18 people coming to a camp to having a camp weekend where we had 65 people. And, you know, that changes your program and we, we just worked well together. Um, and I get texts from him every time he gets a, a recruit on campus thanking me for what I did to get his program there. And, 
You know, he's changed now to going and looking at 24s and 25s who he can't even talk to yet um, because we filled the 23 and the 22. And, and it's crazy to me that there's players, there's two players coming in fall who I recruited back in 2019, you know, just into that changeover who are going to come and, and be part of the program um, that, I, you know, I'll, I'll never see play there and uh, for, or as a coach, you know. So being able to support him in that way, you know, I got promoted to, um, I guess, recruiting coordinator under him. Um, and it got to a point where, you know, we were talking about, well, what does next steps look like? Um, I had, a, I had a, a university reach out to him and ask about me for a job there. Um, and I got all excited and I, polished my CV and I thought, oh, this would be cool to be a head coach, you know, and all this. And then, you know, literally it was the strangest telephone call I've ever had. I spent all this time doing all this stuff and they asked me to apply. So I'm like, well, this is great. And I literally got on the call and like, yeah, great. Thanks for coming. You know, tell us about your coaching history. Okay, great. Thanks. Bye. And I was like, what? 22 minutes of like me kind of just trying to even find my feet in the call, you know? Um, so that job never came about, but it prepared all of the things necessary for me to apply to other places. And Bluefield State came up, um, you know, in the midst of COVID, in the midst of advertising 13 new sports starting here. And when I talked to, um, I got a call from, from uh, someone in the organization asking me about, oh, what is it? What size is the field? You know, how much money do you need to buy jerseys? You know, how much does a goal cost? You know, I kind of worked out that it was a new, you know, situation for them to understand soccer. Um, and there was one or two people in the whole of the organization who played at college level and they were on the recruiting committee, even though it was an athletic trainer and a, and a young lady from the um, human resources department. They, they'd played, so they kind of could ask more relevant questions than anybody else but it was really cool to be um even considered for for the role here uh, and when i was offered it it was it was a really challenging thing to leave montana given the energy and, and the effort and the awesomeness that that's going to happen there you know i do believe that that msub will win the gnac in in the next couple of years under the guide, guidance and leadership there but to be able to come and start your own program from scratch, I don't really think you can ever turn that down. You know, to leave, like leave my mark in a legacy here forever. When you did get there and you're starting a program, it, what, what are some of those, you've talked about the, the 10, the list of the 10 things when dealing with female players and what have you, and you've picked up all these things from these great mentor coaches. When you did get there, what were some of the things that you said, hey, I've got to nail these two, three, four, five things if I'm going to be successful? Yeah, I, I think the challenging thing was as an independent, and, and, and we still are an independent school with regards to, to soccer for the time being, um, finding and convincing other coaches to add your game to their schedule when you don't have a conference and you have no ability to play in the latter weeks of that to try and get you know the 16 18 games that you need that was a huge challenge you know and i didn't realize how much of a challenge that was until i started the process and last year it probably took me a solid three months of con of, of setting an alarm at 7 30 in the morning waking up tackling the inbox you know getting into the office, having a coffee and a bagel, and then, you know, just calling and emailing every single, you know, like I literally went to recruiting pages and Wikipedia and looked at every D2 school on the East Coast and said, who's in five hours drive? Who's in, who can I even call that might reply? And thankfully, there's a lot of nice coaches out there. Um, I then found uh, the, the coach's email list, which helps. You can email, you know, all, all the coaches in D2. Um, but to get that kind of foot in the door, um, I guess the only, the, one of the amazing things about Bluefield, when you're talking to recruits about it, is that it's two hours from nowhere. Like literally two hours from nowhere. But it's five hours from pretty much everywhere. 
You know, you can be in Baltimore in five, you can be in DC, you can be in Pittsburgh, you can be in most of the Ohio and cities. You can be all the way through the Virginias, all the way through North Carolina and into South Carolina in five hours. So, you know, the, the scale here is very, very different. We look at it right now that, you know, MSUB in Montana, if you wanted to go and say, okay, hey, what does it look like in the five hours around there? There's not one single other D2 program. There's no, there's no D2 program within six and a half hours of, of, of Billings. Now, if you draw a six and a half hour circle around Bluefield, you've got around 190 programs. So you're, you know, it's a lot e easier to be able to, to get that. And that really saved me being able to say, we'll come to you, it's only five hours, you know, and, and being able to do that. So, you know, that was probably the biggest challenge that I didn't know was coming. Obviously the recruitment side was huge. Um, finding out that the role was going to be, you know, given to me early December, the 6th of December. Um, not exactly the classical window of being able to recruit 25 plus players to a program. Um, and I have to say, if I hadn't have come from Montana with my own processes and, and my own way of, of driving up those numbers, and having already closed MSUB's 2022, uh, 2021 class, I, I had the support and help of other people as well. So, you know, if anybody reached out to MSUB, they were forwarded to me and I can't credit, you know, or thank Stephen enough for his support there and being able to send over players that, hey, you know, if you're looking for a college home, you know, you're, you're not going to go to Montana because we're full, but here, here's this other option for you. And there was probably, you know, I got two or three girls from the ID camp that I last run at Montana, who you know, weren't going to make it into the Montana squad, but were players that were decent enough to be able to come and be part of a project here. And to be quite frank, um, they've they've excelled. They've been beyond, you know, and surprised. Even I'll call Stephen up, and there's one player in particular who I'll not mention, but I call him. Go so had a group. Great game. Missed out on that one. Yeah, I know. It's kind of been a great <laughs> experience to go through that. And I uh, have the ability to like, hey, well, those girls who didn't make it in, at the ID camp and didn't get offered a place in Montana were still good enough to go and compete and, and really make an impact. Uh, you know, I had one young lady who played every second of every game, you know, the whole, the whole season. Never subbed out, never took a break ran our butt off playing centre midfield for the whole time. And, you know, that's that's elite right there, you know, and contributed. You know, not just filling a space and breathing air, you know. I, I guess the biggest one that I pinned to the door is that, you know, I can't, I, I, and I have a 10 that I present the player. This is sort of the blue. Field kind of like state of mind, like what we you know, we change the I have to, to go and find 10 players today. I get to go and find 10 players and contact them and text them and follow up with them and be, you know, I'm not sure if it's a compliment or not, but one of my mentors des described me as relentless in that regard. And I think it kind of, it's kind of has a double-edged sword that if I see something that needs to be solved and needs to be done, I'm at it. And as an assistant, sometimes that can be an irritation to a head coach, you know, or to a colleague or to somebody in financial aid or to your athletic director. And I have to just acknowledge that sometimes that my, you know, my life sometimes goes to this little narrow thing that I'm working on and I don't see that other people value the things around. Well, it's okay. side of you know trying to set the program up
one of the things that's been consistent throughout this whole conversation um, at each level is your ability to grow programs like from the youth programs out in California to you mentioned becoming really, really good at recruiting to Montana. Montana. And now you're growing this program. What is it about, about, about you personally and what you do that somehow just brings people in? What it, What is it that you do, you put in place uh, that you think makes people go, hey, I want to be a part of that. And you and continually everywhere you kind of bipped and stopped along the way, it's been successful and it's grown. Yeah. I think at the end of the day, if you're passionate about something, people will believe in you. And I think that that's part of the core, whether it's a seven-year-old girl or it's the 70-year-old groundskeeper, you know, or anybody in between. If you can stand in front of somebody and say, hey, I'm going to do all I can to try and make this thing go from here to here or from there to there or whatever it is, if you've got a passion behind that and you're saying, hey, I'm going to give myself to it, if you want to be part of this, you know, this is what you've got to do. And I think that at the youth level, it was more about supporting individual dreams, right? And not bursting a bubble, right? Not shutting a girl down and, or, or a young boy down saying, you can't do that. It's, you know, don't do that. It's more, hey, take that and can we move that here? Can we take, you know, I, I coached young boys who, when I first met them, the, a butterfly would go past and they'd follow the butterfly into the bush. <laughs> and to be able to bring an engaging energy when you're coaching, like that for me is an amazing thing. And I did it at the youth level, but the thing that really kind of stood up was I had the fortunate experience of going and watching the assistant coach for um, Houston at the, M the MLS club train at the San Jose um, stadium when I was kind of like pottering around and he was just so engaging he was like every second of everything he did was like this moment right here, if I drop dead right now, I'm going to be happy because I'm doing this right here, right now. And that for me was just such an eye opener that I was like, I want my training sessions or my recruiting calls or my connections with a, a young person for them to feel that. If they can feel that buzz of like, this is something that's going to be awesome. And it's a challenge to live up to that. It is. It's a challenge to keep that energy high. But definitely as an assistant at Montana, I'd rock up to a training session and like my, my head coach would be like, I love the energy, but like, what are you sniffing? Like literally that kind of like comment sometimes. But it's just like, I am like, I, I love being able to do what I do. Where would you rather be than on a soccer field coaching? Right? Some people might say Bermuda or, you know, Baja or whatever. But at the end of the day, like if, you're, if your passion is soccer, how cool is it that you get to go and watch videos of players and decide whether they're going to be part of your team or not, right? That's just, a, it's just an amazing thing. And, you know, try not to watch it on too small of a screen because you might go blind. But yeah, essentially like trying to get that image of like, how does that player fit into the bigger picture? How can you make that part of what you're trying to do when you're plugging these pieces together? How can you give them the energy that, that you have about the game? And, you know, I was lucky that, you know, I'm, I've met a couple of coaches who've done that to me and, and, and I'm just so, we're so lucky, right? To be soccer coaches, you know, to be able to give that to other people and to start that fire. And um, my old head coach in Montana today texted me a, a, a motivational quote, like, hey, I sent this to my team. What do you think to it? And it's a quotation about um, someone allowing others to stand on their shoulders and step higher than they can ever go. And it, for me, it's like teaching, right? If a teacher could only teach you to their level, we would never get an Albert Einstein. We would never get uh, that next level, right? And it's about empowering people to be thinkers 
not doers and and allowing them to make decisions on the field that allows them to be creative beyond even what I could ever do and to give them the challenge of skills that I can't do. You know, I can't do a rainbow, but I can show the technique to start to get somebody else to do it. And then they can go and do it and engage it on their own. You know, um, and that for me, and giving youth that passion of like a piece of homework that they engage in and buy into, or when you talk to somebody on the phone, understanding where they are and hearing them, really hearing what they're saying, that, that for me is probably the most engaging part of what you can do as a coach. And we have um, some program almost pillars, words and associations that we want to use on our daily life in, in contact with the, with the team that we talk about to recruits. And, you know, I guess I phrase it and, you know, I'll put it into the public domain, but basically if you get three wishes, right? And I'm gonna ask you to give three wishes to gift to the future team that you're joining, right? And I wanted to make this team that you're joining the best team that it can be. And it's not connected to the skills. It's not saying I want a soccer player that's good. It's I want a good team. And that team could be any sport. What is it that makes a good team? And that conversation, for me, allows somebody to think, well, what do I want to see in a future program? What do I want to see in my home for the next four years? And then you spin that around and tell them about yours. What, what would you pick? And, and do they match? And I've literally had calls. I had a call with a U17 women's national team prospect who went to the training camp, had sat on the bench at the U17 level. And she got that question so horrifically wrong. I was like, I don't care how good of a player this is. It's not going to be a player that's going to work here. And I don't know whether that's, there's a fine line between bravery and stupidity, but it was definitely a good call for me to say that and to do that with regards to whether that person would fit with the team culture. And a lot of people talk about team culture. Um, you know, for me, it's about projecting a pathway forward that can guide somebody within the boundaries of what you would want to live and do and operate on. And I think that those words and those values that you can present and talk a little bit about um, in how, why you picked what you picked um, really helps sort the wheat from the chaff or, you know, those individuals who, who, who are going to work within the confines of how you operate as a coach. The last thing I want to ask before we shut this down is, so now here you are, head coach, division two, building a program literally from the ground up it was that time where you saw the ncaa sign on the on the wall and you said hey i want to go after that does scott see another level to this journey is there another rung that you could go to do you think maybe go division one division one assistant or are you right now kind of content and like hey i want to build something you talked about a legacy earlier is this kind of maybe your your stamp of what you are as a coach I, I, I always, I've got two people who keep pushing me to say, you know, what's your next step? And I'm like, I've just been here like, you know, a year, right? Like, and, and, I, and I, tell, I tell you, I say that because I have a friend who wants me to move closer to where they live and they're always in my ear about that. <laughs> um, so I never say never on things like that, but my goal here is to, is to have the field named after me. That would be kind of the, the cool, the cool place, right? Like, you know, who else gets an opportunity but someone who founds a program and lays down a culture and builds something here that, you know, people laugh at myself and my assistant, but we make a joke about, well, hey, when's the time frame for us to win the national championship again? Like as a kind of half joke, half serious kind of discussion, right? About, you know, if we can do this, this can happen. If we can do this, this can happen. And, and that for us is an upward trend. Um, and I feel like to leave Montana, it took something special. And I think it would have to be a similar situation for, for, for me to, to leave here as well.
you know um, I'm, I'm dedicated to to this team you know I want to I want to see the, the the freshman I recruited last year graduate you know I want to be part of a bigger thing that's here um, and you know my boss knows if that's not the way that it's working in his mind or it's not there he's just got to come and knock on my door and he'll have no qualms from me to say hey I'll pack my bags and go if it doesn't fit with him you know but for now Ultimately, it's either get sacked or have the team named after, or have the field named after me. That's a, kind of the two <laughs> options that are in my mind, and they're a long way down the road. <laughs> this chat has been just awesome. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and shut this thing down. This is Karen with Coach's Corner Chats with Scott Forster, and I'm out. Peace. <laughs>